Yeah, if you can open your Bibles to James chapter 3, we'll be looking at verses 1 through 8. Um, last week I was mentioning that I um, was undecided what direction I would go next, whether I was going to do integrity or the tongue. So I decided this week that I was going to stick with the, the first thought, and that was the power of the tongue. And we're going to probably do a I'm thinking probably maybe a four to five week section um, on the tongue, but I probably will deviate on February 14th uh, for Valentine's Day. I'm a person that really believes in, um, or I like doing themed things when it comes to, I want to call it a holiday because Valentine's is not a holiday, but maybe our wives probably consider it a holiday, but um, an opportunity to you know, take advantage of that and also uh, could have a break sometimes, which is always good. And it's also an opportunity that if someone who does not know the Lord to take advantage of that time frame that might be in church because um, of the different times of the year. And so kind of looking at this as um, I, I use combination of a couple things. Um, I kind of have a tendency of being more of the youth pastor type just because of the nature of my background of being over 20 years as a youth pastor. And I use stuff like hot shots that I use in my curriculum. I take some of my own stuff, blend it in. You find a lot of that in my curriculum because a lot of my teaching was using youth curriculum plus blending some of the stuff. And then pretty much most of the visuals are pretty much what I come up with. I'm kind of a little bit creative. I, I, I could, I mean, I, I mean, we could bring a horse into here. I mean, James talks about a horse, but I don't think you want me to bring a horse. I brought a goat into church one time. And... Um, I got to the pulpit. It was one of the first times I was speaking at Palermo. And um, one of the people in the church were really nervous because I was red that day. I says, well, that thing was dragging me across the stage. So, of course, I was red. So, um, but as we look at that, I've shared this illustration in the past, but this illustration is a little bit more added to it. I want to start off with this because I want you to notice three situations that talk or kind of make mention of the tongue, or maybe have a correlation to it. And that is the Chicago fire. And it's about three paragraphs long. Listen, and I'll make some side comments over three areas about how one small match can have a major effect. So Chicago fire. The fire started about 9 p.m. on Sunday, October 8th, in or around a small barn that bordered the alley between 137 to Coven Street. The traditional account of the origin, origin of the fire is that it started by a cow kicking over a lantern. I think I've read this before as we're in the book of Proverbs. It is mentioned the barn was owned by Patrick and Catherine O'Leary. Michael O'Hearn, the Chicago Republican reporter who created the cow story, the word created, understand that, admitted in 1893 that he made it up because it thought it would make a colorful copy. My side comment there is the first thing, how one thing could be twisted to make something look more creative. And we do that with the tongue. Then it continues on. While the barn was certainly the first building to be consumed by the fire, the, the official report at the time stated whether it originated from a spark blown from a chimney on that windy night or was set on fire. We could use another illustration of that, how something can just get carried away by human agency or were unable to determine. The fire spread was aided by the city's overuse of wood for a building, a drought prior to the fire, and strong winds from the southwest that carried flying ambers toward the heart of the city. The city also made fatal errors by not reacting soon enough. How many times we speak and we don't react fast enough and we've, it's already out? That's another comment I thought about as I read this. And as citizens, and here's pretty concerning here. And citizens were apparently unconcerned when it began. Sometimes we kind of become callous, and we don't realize the effect that our tongue can have. The firefighters are also very tired from the fighting a fire that happened that day. And it goes on that over 300 people died and over 100,000 people were homeless. Just one small match, the effect it can have. Controlling the tongue is one of life's greatest challenges. We learn bad speech habits and have a hard time controlling 
those bad speech habits. I've been guilty of it. We learn these habits maybe when we're younger, maybe at workplace, maybe viewing the wrong type of entertainment, or maybe mingling with the wrong crowd. Words are like sticks of dynamite. If handled properly, they can be used for beneficial purposes. But if handled carelessly, then they can explode upon another person. And we're going to look about that, how the word offend, we're going to look in James, talks about a continuously offending, and that's what the tongue does. This tragedy does not ha have to happen. James chapter 3, verses 1 through 8, give us a roadmap on how to avoid these pitfalls and give us some great advice. Let me give you a quick overview, and then we'll look at James chapter 3. The passage that James writes here gives a vivid picture of the trouble the tongue can cause. It talks about being a small member, like the rudder of a ship, or the bit of a horse. The tongue can control our whole body. Sin is fleshly. It is bent towards sin. It can be incredibly destructive. James knows that everyone struggles with the tongue. Let's look at the passage of scripture we're looking at today. And I'm calling this the one small match. As we look at chapter 3, verse 1, I, I like to bring this out because this to me is almost, verse 1, is almost a challenge to those that are what in leadership, which brings up the whole idea of a teacher. And I like to circle things in my Bible. It starts off, not many of you should become teachers. And I circle teachers in my Bible. My brothers, for you know that we who teach, and it was interesting, I was listening to Adrian Rogers here in church today talking about the position of a person in leadership will be judged with greater strictness. And I circle greater st strictness calling a higher standard. And this is why James brings this out in verse 2. And it continues on to verse 8. For we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man. And we only know one perfect man, and that is Jesus. Able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits in the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. We're seeing a lot of good things here. Well, maybe not the tongue, but a lot of good truths. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, straining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life. Going a little bit forward, the whole course of life. And set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast, bird, of reptile, and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. Isn't that sad? And verse 8 says, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is restless evil, full of deadly poison. Let's go ahead and open a prayer. Father, we just thank you for this passage of Scripture. And, it, and it's, it's pretty probing. It's pretty heart-provoking when you look at this, talking about the tongue, because I think we all can relate in some way or form how the tongue has been in effect or hurt another brother or sister in Christ. And we just pray as we look at this that we, we learn how to bridle. We learn to use that rudder like a tongue to guide us and direct us uh, like your son Jesus has done for us, uh, being that perfect person, but also trying to learn to bridle our tongue in Christ's name. Amen. So let's look at verse 2 here as we look at this. And the first point here is called, in the both of notes, is everybody has sinned with the tongue. I mentioned in verse 2, the word stumble, if you read it, it says, and I'm using the ESV, for we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man. The 
KJ uses, changes the word from stumble to the word offend. So what it means here, it's a continuous offending when we look at the verb tense. The sinning happens often or continuously. So we're talking here that our tongue is often sinning. I mean, I think it happened yesterday. I think I had a conversation with my wife, and it might have been in the morning. We got a little chirpy with each other, and it was just like, by the time it was done, I'm thinking, what are we doing? Why, why is this happening? Because it's in our nature. It's very easy for us to offend another person. And I thought about this. Do we find ourselves continuously sinning with our tongue? Look at this that I found on the Internet. And I thought it was how appropriate it was because it brought something out that I didn't realize. Sins of the tongue are motivated by mental sins. Let me read that again. Sins of the tongue are motivated by mental sins. Here are the things they broke out as mental sins. Arrogance, jealousy, bitterness, vindictiveness, hatred, mental adultery, pettiness. Oh, man, how appropriate that is. How many times our tongue gets going because of pettiness? Envy, guilt, feelings, and we can go et cetera, et cetera. All of these sins are focused where? At other people at one time or another. So going back to that whole idea that we continuously offend, and a lot of these things come from mental blocks that we have, and it's all about our focus back to ourselves. So we all have been a stumbling back block, or we've all been offensive. So the first thing is everybody has sinned with the tongue, and we see that in verse 2. Then we see our second point coming from 2b all the way to verse 4, mixed in with our third point. And everybody has been controlled by the tongue. Let's look at verse 2b where it says, He is a perfect man also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits in the mouths of horses so they obey us, we guide. And it goes on talking about the horse, but also the idea of a rudder and a controlling the boat. So the first thing we see as it illustrates here is we see the whole idea of a horse. If you let a horse go free, it will actually trot off and do its natural control. When I was in Wyoming, I worked at a ranch called the King's Ranch. And this ranch, I've mentioned before, was boys that were disturbed and had problems. And I worked there for two months. And so one month at a time, we'd bring in some disturbed boys that needed help. Some would stay for the whole two months. And we had one young man who was from Indiana, Valparaiso area. And he was from the city, but he thought he was a cowboy himself. And he jumped on a horse and decided not to follow the instructions. And he lost control of the horse. And as he lost control of the horse, he actually fell off the horse. And the horse kept on going, and his foot was caught up in the stirrup. Thankfully, the boy was finally able to get off his foot off the stirrup without being, he only got dragged about 10 or 15 feet. But the director of the ranch said he would have been just dragged to death because he couldn't get the reins to this bridle that was attached. He has not, I mean, this is a pretty good size bridle. I'm not into horses. Um, it's kind of funny. Uh, my name, Philip, means lover of horses. I actually hate horses. I'm scared to death of them. And this bridle, yeah, I, I'm laughing. I am scared to death of horses. If we actually take our kids to any type of fair, I can actually not go through the horse or anything that has large animals, my wife has to go through only because one of my close friends got killed by a pack horse. So I've got a little nervousness with horses. It's my fear, and my name is Lover of Horses, which is crazy. But he couldn't get a hold of the, the reins to pull back on, so that bridle would actually control that horse. Thankfully, this young man was able to get off the horse. But that little bridle, I learned pretty quickly, you yank back, that horse stops. 
And Lauren, you don't pull too hard on the rant because that thing's going to rear up that horse. And the same thing with our tongue. We need to learn to bridle it. And that's the illustration. Then they use the next one. Actually, James 1, 6, look at this. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religious religion is worthless. Then he used a second illustration here we see in this passage. Is a ship. A ship will go wherever the wind pushes it unless there is a rudder steering its course. And of course we know that somebody has to be controlling that rudder. My dad was into sailboating. And over my time frame, my dad had an infatuation with sailboats. Uh, it would frustrate my mother because it seemed like every other year he would sell off the one sailboat to get the next sailboat. And at one time, we had two or three sailboats at a time. We had a sunfish. But I remember my dad taking me out sailing and teaching my brothers and myself how to sail. And I remember learning very carefully the rudder and the importance of it. And I remember coming in onto the shore, and my dad would say, Please, please, pick up the rudder. It's small, but we don't want them to get damaged. If it gets damaged, it's going to lose its effect. And I learned how important that little rudder was for guiding and directing on the water. I remember many times my dad would actually let us go out by ourselves. And on many, many occasions, my brothers and I could never venture back. So my mother would say, I think it's Rick. I think it's long enough. Why don't you go out, take the motorboat, and attach the rope to the boat and bring them back in because we couldn't control the rudder. And how important that is, the Holy Spirit is so important of a guide. Like the horse and ship, the tongue will naturally control us for two reasons. We're going to see at point number three, verses three through five. talks about the tongue is powerful. So this is one of the two reasons why the tongue naturally controls us. If we put the bits in the mouths of the horses so they obey us, we guide their whole bodies. Look at the ships also. They also are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also, the tongue is a small member. It boasts of great things. Proverbs 18, 21 says that death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its first or its fruits. The Holy Spirit coupled with the word can bring the tongue into submission and we do not have the natural ability to do that. We need the Holy Spirit to guide us. The Holy Spirit acts as a bit and a rudder in the life of a Christian. The next thing we see that we see how hard it is to control the tongue. And this is really hurtful because it says the tongue is inherently evil. Verse 6 tells us, and the tongue is a fire of a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, straining or staining the whole body, setting on fire their entire course of life and set on fire by hell. The tongue is a fleshly weapon that could be harmful to others. I'm going to read Proverbs chapter 6, 16 through 19. And as I read through this, I realized there are six things that the Lord hates. And three of the six things involve the tongue. It says, there are six things the Lord hates, seven that are abomination to him. The first thing is a haughty eyes. The second thing, which is one of the things that involves our tongue, is a lying tongue. And hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that despises wicked plans, and feet that make haste to run to evil. The second thing we see of that involves the tongue a false witness who breathes out lies. Going back to the whole idea of lying. And the last one 
is one who sows discord among brothers. So if you're going to sow discord, you're going to have to use your own mouth to be sowing discord. So how powerful is it and how evil it is? Pretty obvious. 1 Peter 3.10 says, Whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Proverbs 15, 28 says, The heart of the righteous ponders how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pour out evil things. So why do you think the tongue is hard to control? I started asking me a question, why is it so hard to control? And I thought of some answers myself. It says, sometimes we just want to talk without speak, without thinking. We just want to speak. How often you're at a dinner table and we always got to one up or we just want to be talking the whole time. I'm guilty of that. We don't listen. We just want to speak. That's one of the problems we have. In other words, we don't try to control it. That's obvious. I've had that. Or it is easier for us to let our tongue get out of control. And the other one I thought is maybe a habit. We talked about that. Or maybe it is easy to offend or stumble or be a stumbling block. I thought about that. These are some of the reasons why it's hard to tame it because of our sin nature. Then I thought about it. If the tongue were a tool, what would it be and why? So if it were a tool... I've been doing a lot of construction the past two weeks. My daughter, Brianna, which is interesting, she's the one that's had the concussion. She's getting better. She's still on protocol. But I've been, we put a room in two years ago in the basement. And I, I did not get to finishing the room. How many times we do a project, we don't finish it? Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm guilty of it. And it could be, uh, what is the most common when you're doing a project? The finished work you don't finish off. And that's what it got to me is I never got done finishing off her door. Never got the door. It's been two years. And so I, it was more of a difficulty because I didn't know what to do, partly because it was a cement staircase going into the basement. So I had a huge threshold of probably like, I, I don't know how big to figure a finished door. And so I started thinking about this. The hammer is very handy. But if it's rule, used the wrong way, as a tool, and I use it, whoops, I didn't mean to break that, okay? That helps illustrate this. And it's used incorrectly, it can do a lot of damage. Sometimes our tongue is like that, that we don't think, and we just pound away. I think men are more guilty of that than women. You know, sometimes I say enough, I just pound away, and it could be so much damaging. I don't think about what I say. And if it's used incorrectly, it can do a lot of damage. Then I thought, if it was a saw, and this is not a typical saw. It's actually cutting drywall. But if it was used incorrectly, I could really cut with my tongue and hurt. And... I don't like to pick on my wife. Sometimes that's a little bit more. She would just say something at me, and it would just cut in. I, I, and we have a thing in our relationship. We deal with things quickly. I say, you know, that, that hurt. They cut right into me. She says, I didn't mean to do that. We kind of have this thing of denying self and having less sin accounts in our lives. It's important for us. But how the effect can be, and it can cut, really, it's an important instrument, but used incorrectly, it can be harmful. Then I thought, if our tongue was like a sandpaper, it's useful. It can rub off and smooth off the edges. But sometimes we can use it by rubbing things the wrong way. You know, things come out of our mouth, and we just have rubbed people the wrong way. And the other thing I thought of is a chisel. And how the damage can be, but how handy it can be. As I've been doing the finished part of this door, and the door case that I have, the hinges themselves, were not big enough to put the, the hinge on. 
So I had to take this, and I knew I had to be really careful because if I dug too much, I could affect the power of the door, the hinge, or the importance of it. So I had to be really careful with this. But the same thing, if we dig the wrong way, we could be so harmful with our tongue. So it's like a tool, our tongue, but if handled incorrectly, it could be harmful. Each one of us use these tools as a purpose, but if used incorrectly, it can be damaging. Verses 5 and 6, the fifth point, the tongue can be very destructive. After using all these things, these tools, they still can be very destructive. I was yesterday trying to finish off the last trim board at the top, and I had to go to my friend's house. And I had to cut an inch and seven eighths to two and a quarter because it was so far off level of the top. And in my hastiness, I cut it maybe just a little too big, and I was anxious. So I look up here because this is what I'm dealing with in my basement. And I'm dealing with the hanging um, ceiling tiles. And so it was, I just didn't cut it enough. So now in my hastiness, I probably should have gone back and cut it right. I decided to just jam it up there, and now it, it's all right, but it, I know it's wrong. And the same thing with our tongue. We, we you know, hastily do something, we've said something, and sometimes, you know what's happened to me? Is I've said something wrong, and I know I've said it, and maybe the person hasn't picked up on it, but it's eaten me up. Has that happened to you? You know you've said it, it's eaten you up, and you know it's, and like me, I was visually, I could see what I did wrong, Nobody else would be able to see it, but I knew myself that that was wrong. I know I said something wrong, and nobody's picked up on it. So the tongue can be very destructive. The tongue may be hidden in our mouth, but it has the ability to affect the whole body. We saw that in Scripture, how it can affect the body. It can affect other members of part of the body because it's what? It's evil. It's inherently evil, Scripture says. Our tongue is like a small match. And that was the title. Useful, but it can easily start a huge forest fire. So I want to illustrate this by talking about three things that the tongue can affect. There's three pieces of paper that I have. One is feelings. And we know men that probably our wives have a little bit more feelings than we do. All right, they might get easily offended. And I, I got a lot of things. I, I can get easily offended, but we need to be very, very careful. And sometimes just one match of mean-spiritedness can do a lot of damage whatever it touches. Then we see somebody's reputation. And this match that I'm going to talk about is a match of slander. And how fast it could be destructive. I'm not going to start a fire here. Well, I am starting a fire. We're not going to burn down. <laughs> the last one is friendships. You know, we have some close friends, but something very easy can destroy that friendship. And that's the match of gossip. You think about this.
If you think about this, it's sad how one single word or one statement could deduce someone's feelings, reputation, and friendship. And then verses 7 and 8 tell us why it's so hard to tame the tongue. It says, for every kind of beast and bird, a reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. And that's our point there, number six. And why can't we tame it? It is unstable. What does verse 8 says? It is restlessly evil and full of deadly poison. It is unstable. The tongue must be treated like a bottle of nitrous glycine that could explode at any moment. Each word should be weighed carefully before being spoken. Then it talks about it as being deadly poisonous. It is poisonous. The tongue is full of deadly poison. The poison penetrates not only the person who has the tongue, but also those that are abused by it or offended or a stumbling block. And that's the purpose of the tongue when it's used the wrong way. It is purposely to offend and hurt another person. So uh, five self-examination questions I want to ask you. And all five myself I've been guilty of. And if you are guilty of one of these five, we probably have been controlled by the tongue in some way. First one is, do I teach others things and I've not obeyed it myself? Have I taught my kids and my tongue has gone the wrong way? Oh, yeah, it has. Second one, do I criticize others behind their back? If we do that, we probably got a problem with our tongue. Number three, and we can look at from Ephesians on this one, is my speech consistently clean, edifying, and that's the body of Christ, just be edifying, building each other up, and kind. Is my speech consistently clean, edifying, and kind? Number four, we don't like this one because sometimes we do this. Do I use innuendos? Like, what the heck, or friggin'? That is something we might be guilty of. It's a replacement. I've done it. Number five, in retelling a story, like we saw on the Chicago fire, do I exaggerate in order to impress people more? That is a problem with the tongue. I've done that. Just exaggerate it to make the story sound a little better. Maybe some of it might not even be truthful, but it makes the story sound good. So we've probably all been guilty of our tongue. So I want to close this out of this last illustration. And I like this one because I, I thought about this, is what, is what is the tongue like? And we say it's like a fire and the damage it can do. And I was yesterday in the basement doing the work on my daughter's door. And, and I, nobody was in the house besides my two younger kids, and they were upstairs watching a movie. My wife went out shopping. And I just love to listen to worship music. So I had my Bluetooth speaker on, listening to worship music. And I was thinking, how am I going to close out this whole idea of the tongue? And then as I was going to my wood stove, the Lord said, hey, this is a perfect closing illustration. Once a week, I always clean out the coals in our wood stove. I got a coal bucket. And I didn't bring my coal bucket in because I cleaned out my coals last night. And I'm sure there's still ambers in the bucket. And we don't want a fire in the building, in the church. But I thought about this. And the reason why I do it, because, you know, the fire's not going to be effective. The coals are too built up. 
But when I, when I take out my coals, I've got to have a special gloves on because it gets really, really hot. And when I do it, I, you know, I dump it in the coal bucket, and I always put it outside. And I like putting on our steps because it kind of gets all the ice off that's built off. And I place it there. And I let it to cool off for a little while. And it's amazing when you have a coal bucket of all your coals. And ours is a good size one. It'll come up almost all the way if it's too full. But it's amazing after 24 hours how much those coals have reduced down. And the fire has gone away. It's suppressed those hot coals. And I think sometimes we need to do whatever we need to to suppress our tongue. To be careful with our tongue. Cool it off before we react. And I show the picture of the duct tape. Eh, that, that, that's nice, but we can't put duct tape over our mouth all the time. Right? Now, we get the mask now. How appropriate that is. <laughs> Maybe that's God work to have our mask on. I don't think so, but we need to suppress that. We need to do anything to cool ourselves off before we react, before we harm, before we hurt our husband or our wife or our child or a family member or anybody, a brother and sister in Christ. So let's think before it does damage. It could destroy a marriage. It could destroy a friendship. It could destroy somebody's ministry. We've seen that. Let's close in prayer. Father, we just thank you for James and how he illustrates the tongue. And he uses it as a, as, a, as a guidepost, but also encouragement, but also to warn us. And we just pray that we think about our, our tongue this week, that we realize the damage it could have. Let's pray these things in your son's name.